Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear fellow programmers, as you know, uh, Alang MTP is celebrating its 20th anniversary as open source. Uh, and to celebrate that, I would like to give you some glimpse of Alang's open source journey. My name is Ingela Anderton Andin, and I have been working with Alang OTP for my entire career. I have a computer science degree from Uppsala University. Uh, and before I started working for Ericsson, I hadn't written one line of Alang code, but I did know functional programming. Uh, the first five years, I worked for different Ericsson projects using Alang OTP. And for the last 15 years, I've been working for the OTP team. Time flies, I'm sure you can agree. But before I start, I would like to share with you why I think Alang OTP is so great. I think that the key success is the process module. And unless you have a very simple library application with a purely functional API, your OTP application will be uh, organized as a supervision tree. Uh, and that is, when you start your OTP application, you will spawn the top supervisor that will spawn, in turn, other supervisor processes uh, that will spawn the worker processes, unless, of course, they are added or spawned later dynamically. Uh, and every truly parallel activity should be implemented as an Alang worker process. Uh, like, for instance, a web server request or a telephone call. Uh, and the supervisor uh, lets you uh, terminate uh, and restart your worker processes gracefully. Uh, and uh, it lets you overcome transient errors. Uh, and it also gives you the possibility not to take down your whole system when one worker fails. And the reason we can have this module is that we have lightweight processes uh, that has a much lower cost of context switching uh, than operating system processes. And also you could use the supervisors to suspend your workers so that you can do advanced code upgrade and having no downtime to your system. But I like to start with the cathedral and the bazaar. Uh, it's an essay written by Eric S. Raymond in the late 90s. Uh, and he compares two different uh, strategies of open sourcing. We have the cathedral way, where uh, you open source your source, source, source code at every release, but in between releases, um, the source code is um, restricted to a few developers. Uh, on the other hand, you have the bazaar module, <laughs> uh, uh, where everything is done in the open and you release often and early. Uh, and uh, some examples of these are um, of the cathedrals are GNU Max and GCC. And examples of the Bazaar module are Linux and Fetchmail, written by Eric S. Raymond to evaluate the Bazaar module. Um, um, so if you haven't read the Cathedral and the Bazaar, I would, ac would recommend it. Uh, and I will make some references to this work during my talk. And it will be in little green boxes, so that you know. Uh, in 1987, Ericsson Computer Science Lab invented Alang. Uh, and some years later, in 1993, Ericsson started a department called Alang Systems. Uh, and Alang Systems uh, uh, were, had training and consultancies uh, so that it, they could help other projects use Alang in the best way. Uh, and also in 1996, Kenneth Lundin came into the picture 
and he's today he's the product owner and the manager of the Alling UTP team. Uh, but great ideas survive their inventors. Uh, and uh, in 1996, the computer science lab uh, handed over to a product development unit. And this is when we had the first OTP release. Although uh, the first project using Alang OTP within Ericsson wasn't that great on actually contributing back to Alang OTP. Uh, they made their own workarounds and features uh, instead of contributing back, and they prioritized the project deadlines in favor or before uh, good design. And it wasn't actually until the open source community showed an interest uh, in um, Alang uh, because uh, that the development of OTP and release handling actually started up again because it was halted by Ericsson's not contributing back. But um, problem exploration and ideas are important. Code, not that much. Uh, and when you, uh, when you do a computer program, you gain a deeper understanding of the problem. And you will find that your first solution wasn't that good, and you would want to replace it with some new code. Uh, and in this iterative circle of continuous improvement, it's not always the same person that will do all the iterations. Uh, the important thing is that you uh, learn from the previous iterations so that you don't start the next iteration from scratch. And one big example of this in Alang UTP is uh, the virtual machine format. From the start, it was the jam format uh, created by Mike Williams and Joe Armstrong. Uh, and today, it's uh, replaced by the beam format by Bogdan and Bjorn Gustafsson. Uh, these two solutions actually uh, existed in parallel for quite some while. And the uh, jam was uh, the one that everyone used, and the uh, beam could be improved and stabilized and until it became good enough to actually replace the jam. Uh, another example of continuous improvement is the bit syntax. In uh, the telecom world, we have lots of protocols, and we have often have a need to inspect bits of binary data. Uh, and this was prototyped by Tony Rogvall and Klaus Wikström, uh, and later improved and further developed by Björn Gustafsson and Arndt Johansson. Uh, in spite of Alang being successful um, in projects like the AXD 301, uh, technical merit is not the only thing that matters. Uh, a lot of managers and even a lot of coders think that you need to use the mainstream programming language so it should look good on your CV. And also upper management's wet dream is that it should be easy to replace and hire programmers. Uh, so, and at this time, uh, Alang Systems was deemed non-core business and terminated. And also there was a ban in some parts of Ericsson uh, to use Alang, and that means that you were not allowed to use it for new products. However, real programmers are problem solvers. And the skills in computer science is much more important than skills in a specific programming language. Um, <coughs> if you know the concepts of different programming paradigms and the, uh, and the building blocks, you can solve the puzzle in any programming language. You know, great programmers, they know what to write or good programmers know what to write, and great ones know what to rewrite and reuse. So when Ericsson loses interest in having a proprietary language, 
they should hand it over to a competent successor. In this case, actually make it open source. So along comes our knight in shining armor, Jane Valrud, and convinces Ericsson that this is a good idea. And if she hadn't done so, uh, I think that Alan would probably be some legacy software that no one heard of, and we wouldn't be here today. But now uh, Alan has become popular with outside of Ericsson, uh, and Francesco has started Alan Solutions for consultancy and training. Uh, actually, the ban within Ericsson is lifted, uh, and uh, uh, Alang is now part of uh, radio-based st stations. That's a volume product. And it also has a part in 5G solutions. And of course, Elixir is uh, conquering the web world. And here we are today. So let's go back 20 years. <laughs> uh, when Alang UTP was first open sourced, it was the cathedral way. Uh, and the source code was still in clear case. That's a proprietary versioning system. It has quite good functionality, but um, a lot of administrative overhead, and of course it needs a license. Um, open source uh, was a tar archive, and uh, we got a few bug reports on the mailing list, but having keeping track on bug reports on the mailing list is like a good way of losing track. <laughs> Uh, and we got a few small dips uh, as patch suggestions, but we had to manage to code mostly ourselves and find all the bugs, beca because we were the only ones that had access to the ver working version of the code. Nowadays, uh, Alang OTP is more bazaar-like. We have the source code in Git, uh, and new commits are published continuously. And anyone may contribute, although we have the last say, which I think is only fair, as we have the support burden. Uh, also, bugs are tracked in a public issue tracker. Back in the days, uh, Alang on Solaris uh, was the norm. Uh, and we had things like L interface and G interface, so that we should be able to speak Alang distribution to Java nodes and C nodes. Uh, and security was something that we could add later. And we had the GenFSM that uh, expected event to be nicely banged Alang messages and not, for instance, messages on, say, a socket. Uh, we had the supervisor bridge uh, so that we could pretend that non alang programs could be supervised <laughs> or actually killed if they behaved badly. Uh, we had a lot of little graphical tools uh, that looked uh, good on Solaris and maybe on Linux, uh, but awful on any other platform. <laughs> uh, uh, but reality caught up, uh, and we need. There's no silver bullet language. We need to communicate with other languages uh, over standard protocols on socket interfaces. We need to add security from the start. Uh, we need to have GUIs that look good on all platforms. Uh, we're also replacing uh, port programs and drivers with NIFs nowadays. And we like to have logical groupings, like Observer, where we group all the little tools together in one big tool. I'll get back to that. Uh, and we want to split out the ENETs because it's not a logical application. Uh, so let's go back again. And when I started to work for the Alan UTP team, we had lots of little cathedrals and one bigger cathedral in the middle. Uh, it was the Alang runtime system. Uh, and this is how we ended up with four not fully functional uh, base64 encoding implementations. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's consolidated into one uh, fully functional, fully functional implementation in standard lib. 
uh, and our organization has improved too. Nowadays we have uh, four focus teams. We have the virtual machine team that focuses on the Erlang runtime system, uh, distribution, <laughs> memory management and such. And we have the middleware team that focuses on OTP and uh, release handling and tooling. And we have the protocol team that focuses on security and communication. And of course, we have a test and integration team too. Um, but even though we have focus areas for our teams, uh, assignments can be crossovers. Uh, and uh, we needed, actually, we needed the semantics of selective receive, but also the power of OTP processes that weren't blocking. Uh, so the DTLS uh, uh, implementation done by me and the SSH implementation done by Hans Nilsson uh, drove uh, the development uh, of the Gen server, no, sorry, the Gen Statum implementation done by Raimo Niskanen. And we all belong to the protocol team. But uh, see, this is really middleware team focus, but we believe in building bridges and not walls. Uh, and also we took uh, help from the open source community. Uh, we did this as a pull request and we got a lot of input, some negative, some positive. Uh, and some days it was just a hassle, but uh, the outcome was better because of it, so it was worth it. Uh, and if you're into to finite state machines, please visit Rymo's presentation tomorrow. We also had a lot of collaborations with Uppsala University. Uh, we had the Hype team together with Björn Gustafsson and Patrick Nyblom that made high, high performance Alang. That's actually part of OTP still. Uh, it was great for small sequential code, but actually hasn't proven itself for big concurrent systems. Uh, and after that came Dialyzer by Costis and Tobias, and also later improved by Stavros and the OTP middleware team. And Dialyzer is used extensively within Ericsson and, with, and outside. And last but not least, we have the SMP emulator, the multi-core sport for Alang. Uh, and the main players there were Mikael Pettersson from Uppsala University, uh, Tony Rogvall and Rickard Gren from the OTP team. Uh, if you want to develop code the bazaar style, you have to have a good foundation. Uh, you have to have code that is readable uh, and that is tested enough uh, and that is documented enough for people to believe in it. Uh, because if other people don't believe in it, they won't contribute, they will write their own. Uh, and a good uh, example of a code base that wasn't good enough was the SSL application back in R13. Uh, we got a few bug reports, but most people just rolled their own. Uh, and when I rewrote the SSL application in Erlang, it actually has become one of the applications that has the most user contributions. And now I would like to take the opportunity to thank Andreas Schultz, that is the open source contributor that has um, affected the SSL code base the most, even if I don't, <laughs> even if I threw away some of his code. <laughs> Um, also, we didn't have a good process for contributions in the beginning. Contributions were mainly made by Ericsson people or former Ericsson employees or people from Uppsala University. And the contributions, they were early prototypes and they were untested and undocumented. Uh, and here are some examples. 
We have the HTTP header parsing in the INET driver contributed by Klaus Wikström, and uh, it comes from yours. Um, we couldn't use it for several years as it was untested and undocumented. And finally, Sverker Eriksson did test and document it. We also have the SSH application uh, by Tony Rogval and Magnus Tuing that made the SFTP. And uh, they're smart people, but um, really it was an early prototype and we had lots of instability issues with the SSH application. Uh, we were constantly firefighting it and it wasn't until I did the first rewrite where I merged two processes into one process so that we had only one process for parallel activity that we got rid of all the instability issues. And uh, then Hans Nilsson has rewritten it again to use the Gen Satan behavior. Nowadays, we have the pull requests, and that lets us handle user contributions, and we get complete user contributions with tests and documentation, and it also has given us code reviews and documentation reviews, and the possibility for the OTP team to get early feedback, which is great because phasing out all old APIs is a pain for everyone. <laughs> um, so to be able to continuously uh, improve your code, you need good test co code coverage. And you need tests that you can run again and again and again in an automated way. We run all our tests every night on lots of different platforms, and it catches not everything, but a lot, and it makes us comfortable to refactor the code. And this is also why we always require a test case, because if you haven't tested the code, it doesn't work, and on the odd chance that it does, it will be broken later. Uh, and it's also a good thing if you fix a bug that you test your test case on the old code and make sure that it fails. Uh, for code coverage, we use our cover tool that uh, the latest version was written by Gunilla Arendt. And uh, she rewrote it so that it, tests, it fits better into our test framework uh, and that we can collect test data from several runs. Uh, and I also want to make some advertising of the observer application. That's our graphical tool. Uh, that you can use when you have problems to visualize things like the supervision tree, uh, schedule, scheduler utilization, uh, memory usage, uh, edge tables, minutia tables. You can even start tracing from here. Uh, and you should learn about Erlang tracing because it's very powerful. Uh, but you don't always have the opportunity to trace. Um, and sometimes tracing will just give you too much information. So logging is a good complement. And the open source community has been driving our latest application by Siri Hansen and Peter Andersson, Logger. And Kenneth will hold a presentation about it so you can learn more. Legacy. Yeah, legacy is the thing that when somebody made a decision a long time ago that turned out to not be a great decision. Or maybe it was a great decision back then, but the world has changed. Uh, and some legacy we just can't get rid of. <laughs> An example of this is uh, the five-second timeout of Gen Server Call. This is really not what you want. <laughs> uh, if it expires, the client will die. Or if you catch it, you will have to be ready to receive a message that you are not prepared for because the server knows nothing about this timeout. Uh, and we have uh, changed it in the Erlang OTP code base to be infinity in all places, I think, except one where we couldn't get rid of it. 
Uh, and this is the problem. There's so m much code out there that we might break if we change it, so we dare not. Uh, on the topic of legacy, many people doesn't like records. Uh, and I think the main problem with records is, it's, is that it's just syntactic sugar for tuples. Uh, there's many proposals to replace records, like Elixir structs. Uh, but the maps implemented by Björn Egil Dahlberg does not replace records. It's a hash map data type for Erlang. And the, the rationale be behind this is that we felt that it would be much more value to add something to Erlang that was missing than to try to replace records that we can never get rid of anyway because of legacy. Uh, so nowadays I use maps quite a lot, but I haven't replaced all my records with maps. Uh, so please use the smart data structure that solves your problem and don't compare apples to pears. Uh, I also like to say a few words about support. Uh, our policy is that Erlang nodes can speak Erlang distribution to two major releases back. So 21 nodes can speak with 19 and 20 nodes. However, uh, pull requests are only accepted for the master and the main branch, that is the current version and the upcoming version. Uh, but the projects that have uh, support from Erlang solutions or Ericsson projects uh, they can require patches uh, for some releases back. Uh, and these patches are now made available even to open source users. Uh, and sometimes we will piggyback uh, patches um, that the open source users wishes for on supported patches, because what is good for uh, open source community is also good for the supported projects, even if they don't always realize this. <laughs> um, and of course, security patches will always be made for two releases back. Uh, so to sum up, the turning point uh, I think came in 2009 when Alang OTP was first released on GitHub. And we also changed our versioning system so that it should be understood outside of Ericsson. And we changed our license to a widely adopted and <laughs> accepted license. And at this time, a lot of books start popping up, popping up. And this is all thanks to the open source community and their interest in Erlang OTP. Uh, so please join us of the on, on the journey of continuous improvement, because under the right circumstances, many heads are inevitably better than one. Um, and we like to view all our users as potential co-developers. So on behalf of the OTP team, I would like to say thank you for your contribution. Thank you.